Hallelujah. Come on, let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for your presence. We thank you that you are here with us, my God. And today, Lord, we want to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. So today in this place, in your house, Lord, have your way. Touch lives. Speak to each and every one of us, Lord. Defy skeptics, Lord. Build faith within each and every one of our lives. Lord, we surrender our souls to you today. And Lord, very simply and very humbly, we ask you for your will to be done in our lives. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we give you all the honor, we give you all the glory, and we give you all the power in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give God a praise offering today. I'm not going to say this morning because it's one o'clock. Amen. You can take your seats. Praise the Lord. And I know many of us are, are gathered here today to celebrate with the families that are going to be dedicating their children. Um, and we want to celebrate with you. And so we want to welcome you and thank you for being here with us. But before that, I want to just share for a few moments on what I believe is a very, or what the word says is a very important principle that each and every one of us can put in our lives. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 13. And as you turn there, also I just want to introduce myself. My name is James. I'm one of the, the ministers, pastors here in Vich Outreach, Manchester. And as you turn to Matthew chapter 13, I really want to thank God for, for the life that he has given me. Amen. At 16 years old, if you'd known me 20 years ago, 16 years old, I was a very confused, angry young man, estranged from much of my family, blaming a lot of people around me. But thank God over these last 20 years, God has seen something in me that no one else saw. God saw a value and a purpose in my life that many other people didn't see. And I stand here today 20 years because of God's faithfulness, God's goodness. Amen. How many people can say that God is good? So I want to say, say God is good. God is good. Amen. I want to honor my wife and my children, my wonderful wife, Miranda. Amen. I thank you. I love you. Amen. And I, I love my children, Brooklyn and George. If you get to meet them, if you don't get to meet them, you'll get to hear them. Um, you'll, you'll see them swinging from one of the, the chandeliers or running around doing something. Um, so if you see a kid doing crazy things, just come to me. I'm definitely the parent. Um, and I want to honor my pastors, Pastor Paul and Sister Vicky. Amen. I want to honor them because it takes a lot of trust to be able to release the pulpit and to release people to, to lead and to influence and in many different areas of the church. And so I'm very grateful and thankful for your leadership, for your con continuity, for your faithfulness. And so I thank God for that. And I thank God for an amazing church. Amen. We, we have a special church here in Richard Outreach, Manchester, and I thank God for the church. Amen. Come on, you can give God a praise offering for that. This is a good church. <laughs> praise Lord. So I want to talk to you today about the spirit of a culture of honor. It's not something that gets talked a lot about, but it's an important part of each and every one of our lives is who we choose to honor. Because the one thing I want to let you know today is that you will honor someone. You will always give weight or value to somebody. And I kind of see it like this. If you'd met me before 2005, or actually, let me say it like this. When you get to know me, you know that I love food. And more than just loving food, I love meat. I'm not just meat, but I love chicken. See, I've got to get specific with it. And the thing is, if you'd met me before 2005, and you'd asked me to cook you some food, I would have given you some chicken that was pretty much the same color as my face. And it would have had two seasonings. And you probably know what they would have been. Salt and... Soul and right. But then 2005, I met my wife. And I experienced what I like to call my food salvation. I was set free from salt and pepper. And I began to learn about things like scotch bonnet and all purpose and time and marinating. And I began to learn that there was a new way of living life. There's a new way of tasting food. There's a new experience that was on offer to me. But until God brought somebody into my life, I was ignorant of that. I began to learn that there was jerk chicken, fried chicken, barbecue chicken. And I even learned there's something called barber fried chicken. I know. I know. God's good. But I began to realize that there's more to life than what you think sometimes. And I began to think about it, that actually our walk with God can be like that a lot of the time. And you'd actually be surprised how often I can link the things of God to food. 
Such a spiritual gift, I think. But I begin to realize that many times we walk with certain principles or values in our life and we depend on one or two things and then God wants to begin to do more in our life. And when God wants to begin to do more in our life, he begins to add new values and new principles to our life. And I believe that a culture and a spirit of honor is something that releases God's blessings and God's purpose in each and every one of our life. Even Jesus said to his disciples, he said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And in other words, what he's saying is, I've given you the authority, I've given you the principles and the values that if you apply these things in your life, then you will see not just a little bit of God's blessing, not just a little bit of God's provision, but the fullness of what God has prepared and planned for your life. Is there anyone here that doesn't just want to see a little bit of God? You want to see the fullness of what God has called you to and has prepared for you. God has a plan for each and every one of us. You see, but a kingdom, and you hear about the kingdom of God, and we just want to say real quickly, a kingdom is how a king rules. It's a king's reign, a king's rule. It's how a king leads his kingdom. And the kingdom of God, when we speak about it, is describing God's rule and God's reign here on earth. But when you want to see the fullness of God's rule, the fullness of God's blessing, then you begin to apply the fullness of God's ways. You begin to live by the disciplines and values that God has put. When the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, he gave them a basis for prayer. And he said this in part of a prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, what Jesus was saying is when you live according to the kingdom of God and his values and his ways, you can see heaven on earth. You can see healing. You can see breakthrough. You can see restoration. You can see joy and peace. You can see faithfulness and grace. You can see these things when you live based on the values and the principles of God. And I thank God today that we are a church that pray, that we have a spirit and a culture of prayer in our church. But it's going to take more than just praying. I thank God that we have a culture of giving. But when people give and people have given selflessly, my life at 16 years old has been marked out by people over the years that have selflessly given to the people around them. I grew up in a little village, as you can probably tell by the salt and pepper analogy. I grew up in a little village. And I'd never even seen an airport until I was 18 years old. But the first time I ever even got to go overseas was a sister in my church came up to me and she said to me, here's a ticket to go to a conference in America. Get your passport, you're going. It was the selfless giving of people that have brought the church to where we are today. Peter says in 2 Peter 1 verse 3 to 8, it's going to read a couple of the verses though. It says this, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Let me just stop there. You know you have everything you need to live the fullness that God has for you. You don't need to wait for something. God has already given you every key you need to be everything that God has called you to be. And it says that he's given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. You know the most amazing privilege of serving God is that you get to partner with God in loving this world. You get to partner with God to see your family come to know him. We get to partner and fellowship with God to see all his fullness established right here on earth. You see, we honor God by partnering with him in his purposes and his plans for creation. But when you look at this scripture we see, we see that Jesus came to his hometown. And it says in Jesus' words, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. And it says he did not do many miracles because of their lack of faith. You see, sometimes I think the biggest danger is not that we never experience God. It's that we just settle for just a little bit of God. It says that he didn't do many miracles. So he was touching some people. He was healing some people. And sometimes we come to church and we see people with a freedom and a a grace and a power. And we think, well, that's for them, but it's not for me. But the Jesus that I know, the Jesus that we engage in with scripture shows that Jesus wants to heal everybody. He wants to love everybody. He wants to touch everybody. But many times it comes down to how we see him. Do we give him the honor that he deserves? 
Do we give Jesus the honor that he is worthy of? So I don't know about you, but I want to live in a, 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 a season and a time where not just some businesses prosper, but we see all of God's businesses prosper. Well, we don't just see some healings, but we see many healings. We don't just see some breakthroughs, but we see many. And this key to seeing much of what God has to do is release the spirit of honor to God and to those around us. I believe that honor has a key part to play. It releases God's blessing in our life. But the truth is, is that honor's not spoken about much because we live in a culture many times that leans towards dishonor. We live in a culture that, that leans towards tearing down or pulling down those around us. Dishonor originated in heaven when Satan dishonored God. And then the Bible describes Satan as a god of this world. So dishonor is a, a default mode of the lives that we live sometimes or the culture that we live in. We see it with our children. Many times children dishonor their parents. Sometimes students dishonor their teachers or colleagues dishonor their bosses. All you have to do is look at the government and see they make their living off dishonoring each other. You ever see Prime Minister Question Time? It's about who can get one over on the other. We're exposed to a culture of dishonor. Big Brother, Love Island, whatever it may be, we end up engaging and watching something that dishonors people. I remember being in, in Venice Beach in California. They call it Muscle Beach. Not because I went there, obviously, but they call it Muscle Beach. And the thing is, one day, one day. Um, but there was a place called the House of Freaks. And it struck me because you, pay, you could pay $5. I didn't go in, but you could pay $5 to see people that are considered abnormal. Like women with a giant beard or an electric man. Every time you touch him, you get electric. You know, this type of thing. And yet it struck me that, that this was the value that had been placed on their life. We have learned many times to dishonor people when God wants us to honor people. God wants us to honor. I remember seeing a, 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 or hearing about, um, I think I saw an advert about a fashion program on TV. And they literally dedicate their time to identifying celebrities that have dressed badly and spend the whole program ridiculing them. And I began to think that this sometimes is a culture that our children are being exposed to. The culture that our minds can be exposed to. And the thing is about honor, honor comes from a word, a Hebrew word, kabod, which literally means glory or weighty. And it comes from a Greek word, tameo, which literally means value or even specifically fixed value. You see, honor is who you decide to give weight to in your life. What you decide to give weight to. If you decide to give more weight to your own opinion than someone else's, then you honor yourself over them. If you decide to give weight to your experience more than you do your future, then you give more honor to the past than you do to what God's called you to. You see, honor is about what you give your weight to, what you ascribe influence or authority in your life. And I want to give us three things very quickly that we are called to honor. And the first one, lo and behold, shock horror, hold on to your seats, is that we need to first and foremost honor God. You see, he is worthy of the honor. Revelations 4.11, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You see, there's no point in trying to honor people if we don't begin by honoring God. And he is the one that deserves the honor more than anything else in our life. You see, we honor God when we give more weight to his voice than we do the voice of people. That's why the scripture says, if God is for us, who can be against us? You see, when you give the greatest weight to God's voice and God's plan for your life, it means you're honoring him. But if you're like me, sometimes you can struggle with God's voice in your life. You can wrestle with what God has called you to. I remember back in 2003, 15 years ago, God told me that I was going to preach and teach the word of God. Now, that might seem okay now, but 15 years ago, I couldn't look you in the face. I couldn't look anyone in the face. If I had a conversation with you, I'd be looking down, I'd be looking around because I had no confidence. But over those 15 years, God has never given up on his promises for my life. Even when I've used all the tricks of a trade to get out from preaching or to get out of doing an announcement or you learn the little tricks back in the day when the pastor was about to give out the pulpit ministry to come up and speak, I'd be like, I'm going to go and check on kids gang. 
make sure that they're okay. And you'd find all the tricks, but the truth is, is when God has called you and God has given you a promise and God wants to do something in your life, I want to let you know that he is faithful to his promises. It might be difficult at times. You might have to feel like you're going the long way round, but I can testify today that God never gives up on you. He never gives up on the gifts and the purposes that he has for your life. He deserves all the honor, all the glory and all the power because he can do in your life what no one else can. That's why we honor him like no one else, because he can do what no one else can do. If someone can die for you and rise again, then honor them that way. If someone can give you life, then honor them in that way. But the only person I've met over 19 years of my life that can do for me what I needed done was the person of Jesus Christ. He is the one who saved me and changed me and gave me a future and a hope. God is good. I want to let you know today that God is good even when your situation might not be. God is good even when you might feel like everything's difficult. God is good. He is faithful. There's an encounter in Acts chapter 5. I just want to read three verses. And it gives us an example of what we can do sometimes. In Acts chapter 5 verse 1 it says this. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And he kept, he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also being aware of it, and bought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And keep, part, and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. That term there about keeping back part of the price, that word price is honor. It's saying that Ananias had been given something by God and then he withheld it from him. And I believe that in our lives, not because of, of not wanting to please God many times, but because of our struggles or our experiences, we can withhold what it is that God has given us. We can withhold the promises of God or the calling of God because we're struggling with certain things. And I believe that God wants us to honor him with the gifts and the words and the life that he has offered to us. And yet, many times, we can hold back from him. I believe in this place today, there are people that have been given business ideas, but we withhold the honor from God and we hold it back because we're not sure of whether we will succeed. There's songwriters, there's authors, there's teachers, there's preachers, there's many different things, and sometimes we can hold back from God because we're not sure if he's going to come through for us. We don't want to withhold the honor from God because he deserves it above all else. Any culture of honor begins with an honor of God. Secondly, we need to honor spiritual authority. That's not an easy thing to say in this day and age, but we need to be a people to honor the authority that God has placed over our life. And I'm primarily focusing on the spiritual authority. And the thing about honor is, it can get mistaken, is that honor isn't earned. Honor is given. Respect is earned. Respect is earned, but honor is given. And so we need to be a people to honor the authority that God has put in place. Just like these people when they encountered Jesus, because they didn't honor his authority, because they didn't honor his identity, they didn't get the fullness of what God had for them. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12 and 13, it says this, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you, Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work and live in peace with each other. You see, God places an authority in our workplace, in our government, in many different places, whether we agree or disagree, whether we like or dislike. Honor is not based on like or agreement. Honor is based on recognizing God's authority. And so many times we can come against, but yet God places spiritual authority over each church and each house. Imagine going into Manchester United Football Club. I use that as an example because they're on the news a lot. Imagine going into their club and the reserve team coach or the youth academy coach or the fitness coach was saying something different from Jose Mourinho. You see, although there's delegated authority in different places, the person that oversees the house has the say. They have to lead a certain way. They have to minister a certain way. And although many of us probably do think we know better than Jose Mourinho, especially right now, the truth is, is that we still have to honor authority. You know, in the Old Testament, Israel 
many times would stray from God. They would worship God and then stray, worship and then leave. Many times it can reflect our lives, right? Is that one day we're saying, God, I've never felt closer to you. I'm going to win the world. And the next day, we just want our pillow and our duvet and for that day to pass. How many people have days like that? You say, you know what? I just want to get through this day. And many times Israel would stray from God. And do you know what God would put it down to? He'd put it down to the shepherds of Israel, the leadership. He would say to them in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 3, He says to the shepherds, you eat the curds, you clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter, the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. You see, God holds leadership accountable in a different level, in a different way. And if you're anything like me, you'd say God's solution to bad leadership should be what? Just do away with leadership. Just do away with authority. You know when you've been hurt by something, what's the first thing you do? You pull your hand back. Right? If you put your hand in fire, you pull your hand back. You pull away from what you've been hurt by. If you've been hurt in a relationship, you pull away from a relationship. If you've been hurt by a church, what's the first thing we do? We pull away from the church. But God's solution to bad leadership is not no leadership. It's godly leadership. It's leadership that leads in the right way. And he says in Jeremiah... I love this scripture because he says what God's promise to the people was this. In Jeremiah 3 verse 15, he says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. God says that his promise for us is not to do away with what's hurt us, but to place the right people in our life so that we can receive a blessing for honoring them. You see, the most important thing in a spiritual leader is not being a great preacher although we do have great preachers. It's not about being funny, although some of our pastors are funny or teachers. It's not about having a big personality, but it's about leading according to the will and the heart of God. When you have a leader, when you have an authority in your life that leads according to the heart of God, it's our responsibility to honor those people. Because when you honor God's authority, you honor God's blessing in your life, and God releases something. You see, and I believe right here in Rich Irish Manchester, we have leadership like that. People that lead according to God's heart. People that lead according to the will of God with integrity. And as we honor not only God, but we honor the authority that God has placed in our life, I believe that a window has been opened and that we will see the fullness of what God has for us. And it's not just a little bit. It's not just a few miracles. It's everything that God has prepared for you and I. And the third thing is this. We need to honor each other. We need to learn to honor each other. And I put this last because you can't honor God or your authority if we don't learn to honor each other. You see, why do we honor each other? Psalms 8 verse 3 and 5, speaking of God, says this. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels. And you have crowned humanity with glory and honor. We honor one another because God has first honored us. I want to let you know today that God has valued your life. God has honored your life. He made you in his image, which means that there is a value that no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've seen, no matter what's happened to you or or you've done to people, there is a value that God has placed over your life that doesn't change because of the season you're in. It doesn't change because of the relationship you've come out of. It doesn't change because of the challenges that you're facing. Your value has been set by the blood of Jesus, that he gave his life for you. And so that value is set. And so we treat people not according to whether we like them or agree with them. We treat them according to the value that God has placed on their life. On Tuesday night, I had the privilege... And it really was a privilege of going to a naming ceremony for a new baby. And I was sitting there and we had an opportunity, different people, to pray for this baby. She was eight days old. And we were praying for this baby. And this baby had some amazing names. I was like, I'm not being bad. I was jealous. I was like, these are some serious names, man. It's like, God is my banner. God is my deliverer. God is my uh, provider. And these names, and they were praying over them. And I had the privilege of praying. But also, at one point, I sat there and I thought... I want my own name in ceremony because I got one name, James. I didn't even get a middle name. 
I even get, it's like, James. And James in Hebrew means deceiver. And so I'm like, hold on a second. It's like, Jake, wait. I'm sitting there with my name deceiver all over me. And this, this kid's got like 25 names that everyone's blessing. And so I was a little bit jealous. I felt like asking people if they could give, I'd sit on the couch and they could do a naming ceremony for me. Start blessing me. So now I get the jealousy out of the way. I realized how beautiful it is that they would honor this life by speaking life over that child. There was no negativity. There was no death. There was no doubt. There was no, God, if you wouldn't mind, try and make it easy for this child. It was, no, this child is going to be a success. This child is going to experience the fullness of God's plans. There was no doubt in that room. And I began to ask myself, when did it become so hard to honor each other? When did it get difficult to love each other in the way that God has called us to love each other? Paul says in Romans 12.10, I'm going to begin to land this plane as the church language says. Um, begin to finish the message. Romans 12.10, be devoted to one another in love and honor one another above yourselves. To honor one another above yourselves. Paul's literally saying outdo each other in how you treat each other. Outdo each other in how you speak of each other. And I'm not talking about this soppy, weird kind of love. You know, you see on the phone, I love you, I love you more. I love you, I love you more. No, that's weird. What I'm talking about (laughs) is a kind of love and life where we treat each other with the value, not of who someone was, but of who God has called them to be, of what God has spoken over their life. And when we honor each other above ourselves, God is released to honor your life and my life. And as I finish, Pastor Anthony can make his way up. I go back to the scripture. They said to Jesus, the people that knew him the best, the people that had been around him the longest, the people that had known his name the longest, they began to say things like, as he was performing miracles and as he was ministering and healing people, they began to say, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mum's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, aren't all his sisters with us? In other words, they became so consumed by his humanity that they missed his divinity. And sometimes we can become so consumed by people's weaknesses that we never get blessed by their strengths. We become so consumed by people's struggles that we never allow them to be a blessing to our life. We become so enamored by people's shortcomings that we never dedicate ourselves to lifting them up. You see, to honor each other is not to think that someone's better than you, but it's to live your life to see those around you empowered and strengthened and live a life that God has called them to live. Today, I believe God is reminding us to honor him, to honor the authority that God has placed over our life and to honor one another. I'm going to ask you to stand with me today. And I'm not going to be doing an altar call, but what I do want to do is this. I want us to take a few minutes right where you are, and I want you to begin to genuinely ask God, God, have I lacked in any area of my life in honor? Have I been valuing the wrong things? Maybe you don't know Jesus in here. Maybe you don't know God. I want to let you know today, don't dishonor him by not not giving him a chance. But invite him in. Give him an opportunity to, 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 to show you how much he loves you and values you. And so all across this place, as a worship team leaders, I want you to take a few moments and just begin to ask God, God, where is it that I need to value? Where is it that I need to restore that honor in my life? And as we do that, I believe that God is going to release something to you. So as a worship team lead, take a few moments and just begin to worship him and speak to him. Oh, sing.